to circle the globe without refueling, spending days or even weeks aloft, to capture the imagination of the world. If you want to make the aviation history books, you might do well to start about 100 miles from Los Angeles in the isolated desert town of Mojave. Chances are this small community is home to more big jets than many well-known international airports. But Mojave isn't listed in the timetables, and these aircraft aren't going anywhere. They're just parked in the dry desert air as they have been for some years now, waiting for a buyer. The only regular traffic is small private planes. And for the last six years, Mojave has been the base of operations for another aviation first. In Hangar 77, a unique aircraft has been built. Its name is Voyager and it owes its existence to the sheer determination of three unusual people. Chief Pilot Dick Rutan flew 325 combat missions in Vietnam, winning numerous honors, including a Purple Heart. Nine years ago, he left the Air Force and became a test pilot, developing experimental lightweight planes. Since 1981, he has put all his time and money into Voyager. Gina Yeager, the co-pilot, is an engineering draftsman by profession with a specialty in aeronautics. As a pilot, she holds several world records for flying light aircraft over long distances. For the past five years, she has devoted her life to the Voyager project. The third member of the team is the designer, He's Dick's brother, Bert Rutan. For a number of years, he made his living by designing innovative airplanes and selling the plans to enthusiasts. Voyager evolved from these designs. I didn't create the idea of doing uh, around the world non refuel That's been sought for, uh, oh, 10 years, maybe longer. I realized uh, about five years ago that it probably was within technical reach. Bert began his plan for Voyager with a shape that gives plenty of lift, like a glider. He added small wings at the front called canards, then two booms to hold it all together. The front engine would be used only when extra power was needed, as in takeoff. The main engine was placed in the back, to push the aircraft through the sky. The cockpit had to be as small as possible since the rest of the plane would carry fuel. With luck, this just might make it possible to circumnavigate the globe without refueling. To save weight, they chose to make the airplane skin from paper honeycomb. It was flexible enough for easy use, but the final product would be stronger than steel. This was the secret, carbon fiber an incredibly lightweight space-age strengthener. It came in thin sheets from which shapes were cut and bonded to both sides of the paper. The result was very light, yet strong enough to do the job. Let's go that way a little bit. Voyager had no conventional metal sections. Each part was simply glued into position. The only metal, eight nuts and bolts to hold the wings together. Once the cockpit was constructed, it became impossible to change its basic size or shape. They felt sure that they could spend 10 days here, even though the installation of equipment would reduce the space available to them. What we're going to do is set a system. It will set up something like this, and the radios won't be there. Weight so was we the convert. constant worry. They even saved a few ounces by painting only the tops of the wings. At every stage, they made a check. 300, 400, 453 and a half. 
six pounds below target. June 1984, the press and some supporters are invited to a preview. It's a plane the like of which they've never seen before. I looked out on that thing and, and all of a sudden I thought, or I put my test pilot hat on as a test pilot and tried to put aside all the, all my involvement with the airplane as if I'd walked up to it and saw it for the very first time and somebody says, you're going to be the test pilot and you're going to fly this airplane. One month later, Dick is getting ready for the first test flight. It's a difficult airplane to fly. The wings are flexible. We'd hit some turbulence or a gust response, and the wings would flap up. So the pilot would try to keep the fuselage level as best he could, and then wondering about how bad the next gust is going to be. Is, it, is this light? Am I going to hit a real bad one? Is it going to break the wings off? Or will the, will the fuel tanks rupture? So we're in a relatively high state of anxiety through this whole time. To claim the record, they'll have to fly a minimum of 22,859 miles, the length of the Tropic of Cancer. It's a staggering distance, but Dick and Gina plan to take an even longer route. By traveling an extra 3,000 miles, they hope to bypass several of the world's most dangerous war zones. By February 1986, virtually all the hangar work has been completed, along with most of the electronics. The dream is fast becoming a reality. The only thing that bothers me on uh, perseverance and the physical aspects of this is that Dick would be the last one that would want to talk about it, but uh, he just, he's not 20 years old anymore. And uh, uh, some of those little things creep up on you. I know he likes to think that he can do anything that anybody 20-year-old can do, but on, a, on an aspect like this that takes endurance, I think there is some disadvantage at his age. Throughout the late summer, Voyager and its escort planes were a familiar sight over the Mojave Desert. The schedule slipped slightly, but Bert's original calculations were proving to be correct. It looked as though the Voyager could carry enough fuel to go for the record. With only two more test flights scheduled, the team was confident that they could leave on time to beat the winter weather. But their luck was about to run out. Back on the ground, they saw just how close they had come to disaster. One of the wooden propeller blades had broken right off, and the engine supports had been snapped by the vibrations. It was a miracle they weren't killed. National Geographic Explorer will return after these messages. Who gives you Sundance with 47 standard features and $500 cash back? Hmm. Plymouth, that too. Introducing America's Winners 2 at your Plymouth Theater. It's no big deal. It's a pain. No, no, Carrie. It's called Master Care Car Service. Brakes, alignments, tune-ups. The work. It's no big deal. And a six-month or 6,000-mile warranty covers parts, labor, Wherever they do Master Care service. From Seattle to Schnecksville. Sounds right, this Master Care. So right that fixing your car is no big deal. Finally, taking care of your car is no big deal. Master Care car service by Firestone. I thought they just sold tires. 
Who gives you the Horizon America? Only $59.95, the best value in its class from America or Japan. Who? Plymouth, that's who. Plymouth Horizon America, the pride's inside. Like a lot of business people, I thought all insurance companies were the same. Believe me, there's a world of difference out there. I know, because thanks to the Hartford, we survived the kind of fire that would have wiped out most companies. But with the Hartford's people behind my business, we met payroll, we, we got back on our feet. So please, don't tell me all insurance companies are the same. They're not. When you need us most, we're at our best. The Hartford. Today, millions of miracle Grow gardeners are getting wonderful results with this amazing invention. The miracle Grow no clog garden feeder. It's the fastest, easiest feeder I've ever used. Well, now you can use it to feed your lawn. Because now there's miracle Grow lawn food. It makes lawn care so easy, just drop in and spray on. You'll feed your whole lawn in minutes. You'll see lush green results in days. Stern's miracle Grow lawn food. For a miracle Grow lawn, you'll be proud of. This man takes vacations for a living. So he knows the best time to hit the beach. He knows which restaurants have the most to offer. And when the sun goes down, he knows just where to find just what he wants. It could happen to you right here in the U.S. So don't carry cash. Carry American Express traveler's checks. Don't leave home without them. And now, back to National Geographic Explorer. Uh, we had no idea how difficult this thing was going to be. Uh, we're really pushing the art as far as technology goes. Just about every time we have a problem, that's, that we feel down and rejected, and we feel uh, that it's going to be too hard, that then is all you have to do is think about what it feels like to actually accomplish the mission. And if you still have a chance to make it, uh, you just get all all excited and you just hammer at it again and you keep going, but not a thought of, of quitting. By November 1986, Voyager was set to fly again. This time in a bid for safety, she had been equipped with metal propellers. Because of the last minute change, another round of test flights would be needed, causing further delays. Metal crops were heavier than wooden ones, but they were also more efficient. Voyager was getting more miles per gallon, which compensated for the extra weight. By now, the team had missed the best weather, but they were determined not to wait another year. Food packets were prepared for each day of the flight. To save weight, they were planning to subsist on a low-calorie diet. Still, there was no cutting back on water. Again, an individual packet for Dick and Gina each day. Total weight, about 90 pounds. The night of December 13th was chilly, even for the California desert. At the runway, volunteers used sheets to keep the wings from freezing over. As a final precaution, additional fuel was pumped into the overburdened aircraft. The extra gallons brought the total to about 1,200, three and a half tons of fuel in all. Voyager had never taken off with such a staggering load. And to add to the anxiety, the sheets had not prevented ice from forming on the wings. They hoped to leave at first light, but they needed to be sure the air above the runway had little or no turbulence. At last, they were given the all-clear. Now the...